welcome uh, Professor Eli Bakil. Professor Bakil is the head of the Memory and the Media Lab at the Gotham Multidisciplinary Brain Research Center at bar University. He was the chairman of the Department of Psychology in bar University. Professor Bakil received his PhD in clinical neuropsychology from the City University of New York Queens College. He served as a board member of the International Neuropsychological Society and as an associate editor uh, of the Journal of International Neuropsychological Society. Professor Bakir's research focuses on memory and memory disorders in various populations. Thank you, Jorge. <coughs> I guess that you copied half of my uh, website. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. It's my, I guess, my second time I'm here. So I hope uh, that the students that heard me a few years ago are not here anymore and graduated already, hopefully. Anyway, I'm going to, I've changed the, the, the title slightly, but uh, I'm going to, uh, to main, mostly talk about the same things. Uh, as you can tell, I'm coming from a more, little bit more clinical point of view. Most of my work is with uh, patients, so I understand it's slightly different from the perspective uh, that you uh, look at, at the brain. And uh, so we'll, we'll see how, how, in terms of uh, my research, uh, we try to reach some conclusions about the brain behavior relations. I'm going to start from an quite a strange, maybe, uh, starting point, uh, and present my, my clinical uh, background and uh, the way it helped me to look at certain things when I study brain, uh, relations, uh, brain behavior relations, okay? Uh, I teach, for example, a course in, uh, in a neuropsychological assessment. And one of the things that we, I teach my students is to be very careful when trying to evaluate a patient not to talk in terms of the tests they are using. It's quite common to, to use several tests for memory, for perception, for attention, and then to, to conclude, okay, I have a test for attention. If a person is impaired on that test, so the conclusion he has attention problems, attention problems. And what we're trying to focus and to help the students to understand that each test is composed of several sub-processes and if we're really trying or attempting to say something about the relationship between a cognitive process and the brain, we better, we better go to that resolution and not talk on the, on the level of the test we are using. Uh, so if we want to study brain behavior relations, so the re resolution, it's not enough, it's not sufficient that we have better machines, uh, stronger MRI uh, machines. Uh, if on the, the other side of the equation, we don't have the, the equivalent or appropriate uh, resolution of understanding the behavior, the, the cognitive uh, processes. I'm going to start to, to demonstrate this point by talking about, about a, a clinical uh, aspect, for example, just one or two examples. For example, in, in clinical neuropsychology, the lady Edith Kaplan, uh, was the one to talk about uh, the process approach. She's from Boston. And for example, if we take a, a, an example of a subtest from the intelligence uh, test, the WAYS, the Vector Intelligence uh, uh, Test, and this test is called block design. Uh, what the subject is supposed to do is given a card with this picture and given four blocks. Two sides are red, two sides are white, and two sides are half and half. And here we have three samples, and we have here two patients solving the, the task. As you can tell immediately, both of the patients failed. They, they are not able to actually replicate the pattern. So if we just stay and remain in the level of the task, we really don't, I mean, from this point of view, these two patients failed in block design. However, in we, if we adopt the process approach, we would go a step further and ask ourselves, could we, uh, could we analyze the nature of the failure or the nature of the errors that these patients made? <coughs> and by, by this analysis, to reach and to, con to say something about the, current, the impaired cognitive processes. 
Um, and the answer is yes, and that's from uh, Kaplan's, uh, one of the Kaplan's paper. And basically, uh, I'll, I'll say it, I'll just uh, I'll go to the conclusion that this patient is, is a reflection of the impairment of right hemisphere, and this patient is a reflection of impairment of the left hemisphere. So as you can tell, and le let me just say one more thing. For example, one, one of the uh, ways that we distinguish between, or, uh, between the two hemis uh, cerebral hemispheres is when we adopt the distinction between global and local processes. So in this study, for example, you can see that if uh, that's uh, Navon's uh, kind of stimuli, those of you who know the, this kind of stimuli, the forest and the trees. So when a patient is asked, when patients are asked to copy these patterns, so you can see that the patient with right hemisphere damage loses the gestalt, the, the global picture, and remain and stuck only with the, with the local uh, items, disease. But the M is uh, disappeared. However, the patient with the left hemisphere damage just sees the global pattern and ignores or doesn't see the local patterns. And the same regardless whether it's a linguistic uh, stimulus or a non-linguistic stimulus. So if we'll go back here, so the, the interpretation would be, although both of them failed and would get the same score on this task, the, the, the analysis would tell, will, the, the conclusion will reach analyzing the processes underlying the, the performance is that this patient is only using local kind of analysis and doesn't have the big picture. For example, it doesn't keep the two by two uh, square. However, this, this patient actually sees, has the big picture, he looks at it as a global, you can see for example the similarity in terms of the global picture, the impression, like if you like, it's like a roof of a house. So from a global point of view it's similar, but, the, but he's mistaken with the details. So this approach very much influenced my clinical work and I think in many ways influenced my research work. And what I'm going to tell you today is keep in mind this, this point of view, this perspective at looking at things. By the way, to be more accurate, these are not two patients, but basically it's the same patient with a split brain. One solving it with, he, he, uh, with her, it's a she. One solving it with her right hand and, and one solving it with uh, her left hand, okay? So we see the expression of the uh, processes of the right versus the left hemisphere. Okay. I'm going to, to talk about, to bring, give you examples of certain dissociations which in our studies we, we, we focus on how to, and it's, as I said, it's a cautionary remark to be careful not to conclude just on, based on the task we're using. For example, when uh, the... We, we use the, one of the tasks we're using for testing uh, skill learning is the Tower of Hanoi. And I'm sure that uh, most of you would not know the, the task. Uh, we need to, to transfer these uh, rings to, to, from pole A to 3. You're allowed to move only one, one ring at a time, and uh, one disc at a time, and you're not allowed to put a large one on a smaller one. For three moves, it takes uh, seven, for three uh, uh, rings or discs, it takes seven moves for four, move, uh, four discs, it takes 16 moves, etc. Okay, so uh, when we reviewed many years ago, it's, I think it's a study from 97, uh, when we reviewed the literature on elderly, we noticed that there are many inconsistent findings. And when we look more carefully, we, we got to, to the conclusion that basically they were looking, people were looking at different parameters of the task while solving the task. Some of them were looking at how many overall moves it took to solve the task. So if the elderly were uh, used or needed more moves, then they were considered to be impaired. Others were looking at the uh, slope, the learning rate. So what we did is we simply analyzed both of, of, both of things and reported both of things. And what we discovered is that the, the baseline performance of the elderly was really impaired, so they needed more moves to solve the task. However, when we train them, the learning rate is similar to that of, of normals. 
So we cannot just say, okay, they have a procedural learning problem because they, they are impaired on the, on the Tau of Hanoi task. So the question now, we, have to, we must go a step further and ask, on which aspect of the task are impaired and what is the significance? Okay, for example, a, a similar study which led us to a similar conclusion where we applied the divided attention task while performing the Tower of Hanoi. And what we found was that, the, that under divided attention, performance is, is impaired, but in the sense very similar to the way that it was impairing the elderly, that the baseline have changed, but the learning rate remain normal just like that of the controls. So we concluded, now uh, I, I won't take you through all the, the consideration, but the, just I uh, would make a statement that we, we consider divided attention as interfering primarily with the performance or with the activities of the frontal lobes. So, and it makes sense because we know from many studies, studies of Raz, Stanley Raz and others, that uh, measured uh, structural changes with age that the frontal lobe primarily is the one that shrinks and, and deteriorates with normal aging. So if we take a re age range between uh, 30 to 90, while the posterior lobes would deteriorate about 15%, the frontal lobe would deteriorate about 30%. So it makes sense that we'll have similar pattern of results uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, either manipulation of uh, divide, using divided attention or when we test aging. Now, that led us to, to two conclusions. First, is at least two independent processes are involved in this, solving this task. Because we know one of it determines the baseline performance, and the other one probably determines the learning rate. The other thing that, uh, that uh, we, we were concluding is that these, they operate in parallel rather sequentially. Because there are some models of skill learning that would say, okay, we start, and I'm going to, to mention some of these, that we start with a more uh, effortful, more controlled type of, of uh, processes while solving a cognitive task or while learning a skill, a cognitive skill, and then we move into more automatic kind of processing, as if we have certain area and then there is a change. And there are some uh, fMRI studies that would support such a claim. But that would not fit to these findings because, because what we see is the, a, a normal learning rate right from the beginning. So there's no phase. So if we, we interfere here with, with the activities of the frontal lobes, we, and if it was a, a, a stage prior to, to the, the that the, for example, the basal ganglia or the cerebellum will kick in, then we would expect a, a difference already in this, in this uh, stage, but we see here that from right from the beginning, the learning rate is normal. Uh, by the way, when we use divided attention, also we, we, we looked at, at various tasks, and what we found that, as you can see here, that the tarifano, which is considered a more cognitive, effortful kind of task, was impaired in, say, in this aspect of the task was impaired. However, when we took, uh, we used a more perceptual kind of task, for example, mere reading task, we saw that, that, uh, the, that performance was identical whether under full or divided attention, which again suggests that although these two tasks are considered procedural tasks, and by the way, both of them were among the first tasks that uh, Cohen and Squine in the early 80s used to coin the distinction between procedural and declarative memory when applying this task to amnesic patients, including HM, demonstrating that HM, uh, HM's performance was normal on these two tasks, but they did not make a distinction between the tasks. And at least, and we, we can tell that by applying, for example, divided attention, these two tasks do not behave in the same manner, and it has some implications which uh, I would not uh, touch upon now. Okay. If we continue, one of the things that we know that the learning learning is takes the form of a power function. And uh, already in the 60s, Fitz and Anderson later were aware or claimed these are cognitive psychologists that were not really much uh, interested in the brain. But they have suggested that the process of the learning process of a skill 
uh, requires to go through certain steps. As you can tell, it doesn't matter the terminology. They use different terminologies. Bas basically, they mean very similar things. That you see that the initial stage is more effortful, is more declarative, cognitive, and eventually, when the uh, when the skill is mastered, then it becomes uh, automatized. Okay, so uh, so the way aware that there are few that the, although we see it as continuous performance, probably we have different cognitive <coughs> processes hiding uh, behind this performance. And it's not really the same, uh, the same process that's taking us or leading us all the way through the, uh, the skill acquisition. So, how do we know? Do we have evidence, indication that really there are several cognitive processes involved in this uh, process of uh, acquiring the skill? So, one of the distinction, we usually it's difficult to divide it to three stages, but if we'll take We'll divide it to two stages. I mean, just by looking at, at it, we know we can see that one stage is much faster, and the other stage is a slower phase. And uh, and are they different? So there are many ways to show that they, are, they, they involve all the uh, different cognitive uh, sub processes. So one way to demonstrate that is a study we did. We asked the question of transfer. So what if I need, I mean, usually when we learn a skill, when we learn to drive, eventually I want to learn to drive, not on the drive, uh, on the car which I study or learn driving, but eventually I want to be able to drive on various cars. So, so these are different repetitions of the same task, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So far what I showed is, is the, the way that skill learning was measured is by continuous repetition exactly of the same task. Okay, now we're going to see what ha what's happening. We're going to address exactly this question. What's happening if you want to make a slight difference? So one of the things we were interested in is what happens if we want to, 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 to measure transference? And with the tower funnel, it's, it's easy because always there is a problem. How do, what, how do exactly you define transfer? How similar should be the task to the original task and how different it should be fr from it? With the tower funnel, it's relatively simple. Basically, I keep the same task. The only thing I'm, I'm, I'm doing is just changing the, the, the starting point and the end point and the target point, okay? So, we, so that would be the transfer. If, we, if I train a person on, from one to three, that would be the, the training. And the transfer, once I'll have a transfer from one to two, and once I'll have a transfer from two to three, okay? So two, two versions of transfer. And now the question, if, uh, if the transfer is here, so in early stages, versus if the transfer is in later stages, when there is a cost or higher cost for the transfer? It's not a trivial question, because intuitively we might think the more you practice, the better uh, virtuos you are. You can better transfer your knowledge. Yeah. Uh, so maybe it is the case that. No, the next one? No, the previous. Previous, okay. Maybe it is the case that uh, doing it uh, from 120, uh, reducing my solution time from 120 uh, seconds to 40 seconds is easier than reducing it further. In the sense that the, it's the intrinsic hardness of the problem. Uh, okay. I mean, let's, let, let's, let's, I, I'm going to show because we're also measuring it relatively to the point of the transfer, okay? J just bear with, with me for a second. So we're trying to, to see the transfer at two different points of, of the task. And what we found was that if we transfer here, you see the cost, whether we measure it with number of moves or the solution time, here the cost is minimal, and while the cost, when you're in advanced stage, you're paying a higher cost. Now, I think it's relevant to what you've been asking, and if we look at it not as absolute cost, but as a relative cost, because when I, I see here an increase of 10, millis of 10 uh, seconds, it's much more significant if, than seeing it here on an earlier stage, okay? So if we put it, if we present it as a ratio, so we can, the picture is even clearer, that at the early stages there is al almost no cost for the transfer while we are in the advanced uh, phase, the cost is much higher, okay? 
so the, the conclusion is that the effect of practice on transfer is the more practice makes less transfer. However, in real life, we, we see that it's not such a, a simple thing because I always ask the question, okay, let's assume that uh, I'm taking my son uh, on a trip to Europe and we're renting a car. He has an experience of uh, three years as a driver and I have a, an experience of, I don't want to tell you how many, but let's say 30 years of uh, experience driving. So according to this conclusion, if we, if we are going to rent a new car, which neither I nor him have driven it before, it's a new car. So according to, to this conclusion, we might tend to, to, to guess that for him, it will be easier to adapt to the new car than for me. But we know that it's not the case. I would prefer to drive the car in Europe, not letting my son drive it. So how do I explain that? So here we got into an, a, another distinction of how we acquired the, 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 the skill. And that goes back to your comment. Are we training it in the same way? Are we practicing various things or various versions of the task? So what we did, uh, we are based on, on other studies, and I'll mention some of them uh, later, that, uh, that will come from the edu educational, uh, like the training, uh, math, uh, I mean, math questions, questions in math or different exercises in, in, in mathematics, and they got to the same uh, intuition or the same insight, but we wanted to, to measure it and to quantify it. So what we did, uh, or this guy is a Japanese uh, researcher, Hatano, has made a distinction between adaptive expertise versus routine expertise. And what he says is it all depends, the, the, the ability to transfer your skill is, is not only a function of the stage that you are at, as we demonstrated before, but it's also a function of the nature of your training. And what he said was that if you train a very rigid training, then you become a, a routine expertise. Then you, you are, you'll get better, but be doing exactly the same thing. And every minor change would, would cost you extra uh, moves, time, whatever you're measuring. However, if you train in more, uh, in a various, in more rich way, in the sense that you're exposing the person to variety of, of vari variations of the task, then you're allowing this person to uh, transfer in much less uh, uh, cost. So how we, and then I thought how we, we would apply it to the Tower of Hanoi and, and test this hypothesis. So if you look at the Tower of Hanoi, there are really six ways of playing it, as you can say, see from one to two, one to three, two to three, and backwards, okay? So there are six ways of playing the task. So what we did, we, have, we had two groups. One group, the routine expertise, was training each individual, was trained on 10 times on one particular setting. This one from two to one, the other one from three to two, another one from one to three, whatever. So each, each individual was trained, all the, all the combinations, was trained on one of the six uh, possibilities. And then in trial 11, we uh, presented the person with a new task, with a new setting, okay? However, the, the individuals that were in the adaptive expertise group with various uh, variable training, what we did is, that since we have six options to play the, the task, so for each individual we chose five of the six, we kept one as the 11th trial, and we took the other five, twice each one of them, so the person had have experienced five versions, each one of these versions was presented twice, was tested twice, for example, two to one, it must be here somewhere, two to one. One to two, you, here's one to two. Three to one, the person was not trained on three to one. So we have the same setting in a sense that this group were trained 10 times exactly the same uh, fig uh, configuration and then transferred to a new setting. Here, again, 10 times practice, 10 trials, however, five uh, versions of the task, and here are presented with a new, a new setting, the same here. And what we found was that, as expected, 
when you measure the, the learning rate, the, the group with the routine training, the, their learning rate was faster. Okay? They were faster learning the task. However, when we, we compared the group to the 10th trial to the 11th trial, the adaptive group did not pay, there was no cost for the group that trained with variable training. However, the group that was training the routine training had a very significant cost. So our conclusion is that, that depending on what's your, your ultimate goal, if your ultimate goal, one second, if your ultimate goal is to have a, a very routine, for example, if you are Nadia Comaneci and you want to, to, to learn and to practice a certain exercise, so, and, you, and it's the same size, the same height, so you better practice exactly the same thing over and over again. However, if you want to train somebody to be able to extrapolate, to be able to transfer to similar uh, tasks, then you better train this person with a more variable, uh, variable uh, training. Okay? Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the cutoff for knowing game, uh, when, when you're in position one, that you can move either to position two or three, any, any, any piece that is on top, right? It yeah. It doesn't cost you extra. So essentially, it doesn't matter where you start and where you end up. It's just a question of perception. It's the same, exactly. If you can have the same computer program solving it. Right. You just change one to three or three to one, it will do the same work. So we're talking about a group of people that understood that, that the position is meaningless and a group of people that didn't understand that the position is meaningless. Okay, so you, you're now trying to explain why, why we have these differences. So, okay. Uh, so yeah. The big difference between the first phase where you really learn the algorithm, the cognitive task. Okay. Okay, so? So it's entirely different. So how fast I can move my hand is very different than how fast I think about the move. Well, it depends. I mean, we, when we, first of all, we, we can see, we, I'm going to show you more data with, with more, more disks when you still can improve even with just the number of moves. So the number of moves, to be consistent with the number of moves is also something you continue learning, okay? But, but you're right. I mean, there are different ways of interpreting the, I mean, what really happened. Uh, one way of looking at it is that when you expose a person to various uh, configurations of the task, you're forcing this person not to rely on the specific sequence, which is like, if you wish, the simplest way, the least effortful uh, way of learning so to solve the, the task. Okay? It forces you to, to have a better... Uh, uh, abstract representation of the solution, a more abstract solution than just learning the sequence, okay, after this move I do this move and then I, I transfer this disk to here and to there. So the fact that you are uh, forced to deal with different starting and ending points, it forces you to, to not to rely on the, just the sequence of solution, but to rely more on the more abstract representation. So it takes more time, but then you, ha you are able to transfer it to, to various combinations. Okay, so, and by the way, there is supporting evidence to that, for example, when the, in, in the literature uh, that is uh, studying development of schema, how we develop a, 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 a schema, like in terms of Piaget and others, that by exposing, for example, in development, by exposing children, the more you expose them to various combinations of various, even a schema of what is a dog, okay? If you present a child just a very, uh, a certain type of a dog, then he'll have great difficulties uh, transferring it and identifying a dog when it's slightly, if you always saw dogs that are uh, black with a short tail, then each time he'll see a dog, I mean, if after a while you'll show him a dog with a, a white dog, uh, he, he would not uh, be able to conclude that it's a dog. You won't call it a, girl, a dog. However, if you expose the child to various types of dogs, then even when he'll see a different dog that he have never seen before, his ability to transfer and to conclude that it's a dog it would be better because he, he has now a more abstract representation of, in this case, of the solution, in other cases of whatever it is, a dog or something else. Another task that we are using is, is the motor sequence learning task. 
or there are several variations of it. One, the one I'll be talking about is the serial reaction time task, which is actually a, a person is presented with, uh, he is asked to press the key corresponding to these numbers. So he doesn't have the numbers. He just says, uh, we tell him that's the first, second, third, and fourth. And each time you see light on, one of, on each one of these, you press the corresponding button. The, the individual, the subject that is not aware, doesn't know that there is actually a sequence that repeats itself. Okay? A repeating sequence. And what we see here is, a, a, again, a, an acquisition of this sequence. And how do we know that, that, uh, that the specific sequence was acquired? And it's not just a, a, an improvement in eye-hand coordination. So usually what we do is we'll add a, a block of either random a sequence or a different sequence. And then what we see is we see a higher reaction time of normal individuals. And for example, patients with uh, Parkinson's disease would not see this, uh, would not uh, see this cause with, uh, with patients with, uh, with Parkinson's disease. I mean, they'll continue performing, but we don't see the cause of changing the sequence which is an indication that they probably did not learn the specific sequence, and their improvement is, is primarily due to a better eye-hand coordination. Uh, now, for this particular uh, study I'm going to, to tell you is we did not use the SRT. We used the variation of uh, Avicani has a task of finger-opposing uh, task. So we had a, a computer v uh, version of it. The, the main difference between the SRT and this task is that in, uh, in the finger opposing task, uh, the individual knows the sequence explicitly. We tell him that is the sequence and just repeat it more and more and more. In the SRT task, uh, the person is not aware of the repeated sequence. And what we, in, in a study we, we've published uh, a few years, two years ago, we try to analyze and ask ourselves, because we were talking about the, the early phase and the, the, the fast phase and the slow phase, and the question is, okay, and now we have a indication and support to the fact that, that the cognitive processes underlying this phase are different from the, uh, the processes here. By the way, what time I have? Six. Okay. So, what we try to, to find out, do we have any marker indicating the, the transfer from this phase to this phase? Because when we look at the mean, the group data, we don't see a, a clear indication of that. And what we found was that when we analyzed the data, uh, we found that, that of, of each individual, and here in, the, in that paper, uh, it was published in the Journal of Experimental Psychology, Learning, Memory, and Cognition, JPLMC, that uh, we were asked to present the raw data of four good individuals and four uh, bad individuals. But most of them were, were in this group. So what we found was, when we tried to take the, the, the performance, the reaction time of each individual, and apply to it to see how, much, uh, how uh, well it fits to a power function, what we quite consistently found that it, it fits a power function up, up to a certain point. Uh, that, that's uh, with the circles, okay, that's this phase. And then there is an increase in invariance. Suddenly there is an increased variability. And then again, a phase with the var variability decreases. Okay, so again, what, although we see the, the, we, the, when we look at the group performance, we see a, a learning that fits the, the power function very well, but when we apply individual, the performance of each individual, what we found is that there is a reduction and then an increase in uh, variability. Uh, Adi, Esti Adiafe, uh, she's a senior author of this paper, she tried to simulate this data and basically, how can we, we create a group function which is smooth and, and looks as a power function from a, a individual that will have an increase of variability in, and, and it is possible. And you can see that each individual has, we, has this increase in variability in different phases. So we are assuming now 
that this is maybe the, the marker for each individual indicating the, the switch of the cognitive process, processes in the early phase, the fast phase, to the slow phase. So apparently when we train and we get into more, uh, we, we reach a certain level of, of uh, mastering the task, we, we probably, it's not done consciously. It's not that the person decides now to try different strategies. But apparently we automatically, un, unaware, we are unaware of this process, we try now different uh, strategies, and then eventually we, we, our performance is better than the, when we ended up. So it, now it doesn't fit anymore the, the power function. We see a, a significant increase, a, devi a significant deviation from the power function. So the way we're looking at it now we, as, as a window to, to ask very interesting questions. So if we have a marker for each individual where his, this person is, is actually going into, into a switch, into transition from one process to another process, then it's very interesting. So first of all, uh, we, we are now testing several uh, patient groups because now we're not only looking at how fast you're solving the task or how accurate you're solving the task, but we're also asking ourselves, uh, is, it a significant, is it significant that this individual, for example, is switching, is, is, is moving into the second phase, the increase, as indicated by the increase of the variability, earlier than these individuals? What does it mean? That it, does it mean that he, is, is, he acquired, he finished, he exhausted the first phase faster. Does it mean he's a better learner? Okay. So now we're going to use that as, as a measure and see what, what it uh, predicts. Does that predict a better learning curve if it's earlier or later? The second thing we, we're asking, oh, before I go to that, yes, I saw a question. Yes. You're asking the, the rationale why we're doing it. I mean, we're not doing it consciously. You, you realize that. But, but I mean, the, these, are the, these are the data which suggest that apparently we, it's, I mean, I'm trying to, I mean, to understand the, the, the rationale of what's happening is imagine you, you moved to live in a certain place and now you're trying to find the best way, best route to your office. So initially you have a high variability because you're trying different routes, okay? Eventually, you think that this route is the best one, the shortest one. So for a while, you're stuck there. For a while, you're doing it and, and getting faster, and you know the exact timing to live. And, but after a while, apparently, we are not satisfied. And you say, okay, you know what? Maybe I'll try, I'll, I'll try something different. different. Maybe I'll try a different route, although I'm quite happy with this one, but can I improve on it? So you're trying to, at this transition phase, you have a, a higher variability because at the same time, you're trying several things. And apparently, uh, you, you might know about, about, like in development, apparently we, there is a similar pattern. Children, when they move from one stage to another, they are less predictable. There is an increased variability in their performance when they move from one phase to another when, when, they, when they develop. Maybe. Yes, go ahead. What do you mean by U-shape? The U-shape, the, the developmental phenomenon in certain areas where you start out with what looks like good performance, then you decline, then you go back to good performance. Yeah, and even in, in our case to ev even a better performance. And yes, better in the sense that when you get again to that good performance, you supposedly know the rules. But, but here you don't see necessarily an increase in performance while, while increasing variability. It doesn't necessarily go hand in hand. So, so variability is a phase at which you don't know how to behave. No, you, you, uh, the way we interpret it is in the phase when you are checking alternative strategies. Okay, okay. So it's in a way, a way of not 
not to stuck on one on one solution. And I, I, I hope I'll have time to show you some findings with with uh, Parkinson disease patients, which might that might explain. We don't we did not do this kind of analysis and test with, with this patient, but maybe that's the problem that they they stuck with a solution and they, and they stop exploring other solutions. And we know about the studies of, of the, the relation between exploration and dopamine. Okay, so maybe that's a, the kind of thing that is impaired with Parkinson's disease. Okay, so now we're doing several things. One of the things that we're doing, I mean, there are studies showing a, a transition uh, while you learn a task. Okay, for example, the studies of Schneider, Walter Schneider and Chain of when you're a novice while, when, versus when you're more in a, 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 you master the task, you're an expert, that these less cortical activities, particularly reduction in frontal lobe activities. Okay, so initially when we drive, uh, initially we are more engaged, we are more aware of the way we're driving when we are new drivers, and after a while when we, we are become experts, so we, we free our frontal lobe and we're able to talk on the cellular phone, we should not do that, and with our friend sitting next to us, because now the, the frontal, we are more expert, and we don't need to make conscious, effortful moves while driving. So we, we are aware, there are indications of this transition. Uh, there are indications of Dwayne that showing changes uh, as a function of practice in the cerebellum. Now we are conducting a study with uh, the MEG we have in our, in our institute, uh, exactly testing that, because the, the big advantage of the MEG is the temporal resolution. So now we want to see the, the brain activities associated on individual, individual basis, associated with the transfer from the first phase and then the increased variability and then the second phase. We want to see what is the corresponding, the corresponding uh, brain activities in, in, uh, in, uh, re relative to the behavior, to the uh, behavior we're measuring. Okay, a uh, few more things. Uh, online versus offline learning. So uh, we, we talk if when we practice, and this is a replication of uh, other uh, groups have, have demonstrated that. For example, when we take a, a sequence task, short training, go home, go to sleep, come back, we see a, a, a deterioration of performance. Of performance here, it was not so dramatic, but still a, a deterioration. However, following a long training, more intensive training, when, uh, when a person sleeps a few hours, there is a offline learning. We assume that it's a consolidation without further training. The person comes the day after and we see improvement. By the way, one of the questions we are asking uh, that we have now a study going on that also might be related to these two phases we were talking about. So here, we are playing it safe. We're only training three times and then we're training, I think, another 18 times or so. So, but what we are going to test now, what we are actually looking at is looking at individuals and we're stopping them at different uh, phases of the training and analyzing the data. So some of the individuals will be, will be stopped before getting into this transition phase of increased variability. The other groups will, be, will stop them while they're in the middle of it. Other group will be when they pass this uh, variability phase and they're now into the second phase. And our uh, prediction is that that's exactly what that consolidation could take place only when you moved into your second phase. As long as you are in the first initial phase, which we consider the phase up to the increased variability, we, you, we would not see a consolidation. We won't, would not see offline learning. However, if you pass this variability phase, then we expect to see, we'll be able to predict on an individual basis, because usually the way we do it now, we, we train so much that we make sure that all of the individuals are now in the second phase. Or here we train so little that we are sure that most of the individuals at least are still in the first phase. But now we're going to analyze it on the, on the basis of, uh, of every per, of individual basis and see if that really predicts this, uh, the offline learning. They are better. I mean, we, we, 
we don't know. I mean, that's, I mean, we, I mean, the only way that, at least with this task, the only thing you can tell is that, that just performing it, performing it much faster. There is an increase in performance. Now, it's interesting. With the Tower of Hanoi, we did not, we were not able to replicate this data. I have it further down in the, uh, I won't show you, but if you're interested, I can show you it. I have it here. That we don't see, for some reason, with the Tower of Hanoi, even following extensive training, we still see a, a, a cost after, uh, after overnight. And maybe because, because of its uh, more cognitive component of it, so you need kind of reactivation, of conscious, effortful reactivation of the procedure before going, going into the automatic phase. So now we're looking into different strategies. The, the other uh, possible interpretation that we are testing, why in, we don't see it in the Tower of Hanoi, is uh, maybe because when they train, particularly if we want to see with massive training, we use five disks, which is the minimum is uh, 31 moves. So uh, many of them do not reach really plateau. They don't reach, apropos your question, they do not reach 31 moves. So one possibility is maybe they go to sleep and consolidating on some errors because it's not a perfect. So now what we're trying to do is to have a procedure which prevents them to make errors and see if we prevent them to make errors, then do, do, uh, would, we would, see a, a, would we see a consolidation. Okay? So I told you that. Uh, uh, so, as I told you, we're using this increased variability phase as a marker for shift from early to late phases in, in, uh, different, uh, in different tasks. Okay. Uh, again, people are, were rep reported on the learning phase and, and, and the learning curve and, and the consolidation as if they're different aspects of the same thing. It's more of the less. So I can tell you if uh, this group of uh, individuals is impaired or not impaired by reporting uh, about either one of these. A very a, a paper that is not out yet, just now we completed it, is we show, for example, with uh, children with uh, dyslexia that th they, they did not have a problem with the serial reaction time task. Their problem was the learning. They somehow stuck here with the learning, and there is an interaction here. But in, if you see, they have a, a normal consolidation. So here... And we have, uh, you, you're invited to, to read the paper, it will be out soon. And so we, we're trying to interpret why this phase is preserved and this, and this phase is impaired. So again, different components of the task represent, we think, different brain uh, processes, uh, different brain substrate that are uh, that, uh, su uh, subserving these uh, cognitive processes. So, it's not trivial. Each component represents uh, different uh, brain activities. And finally, I'll, I'll go over it uh, quickly. It's a paper we did not publish it. We presented it in the uh, International Conference on Memory, the ICOM, that was uh, like a few months ago in England. Uh, we tested uh, the uh, patient with uh, Parkinson's diseases in collaboration with Avi Kani and uh, Sharon Hassin uh, in uh, Sheba Hospital. And one of the things we ask ourselves, okay, if we'll have, m m one of the problems with testing uh, uh, patients with Parkinson's disease that, okay, we show, let's say, that they are not performing as well as, as normal individuals, control individuals. But the question, one of the questions was, I mean, if we'll have a massive training, w would they eventually catch up? Would they eventually reach normal performance? So, so that would mean that they're just, little bit behind, or extra training would not necessarily help them. The other thing we wanted to compare, learning rate, we wanted to compare also offline learning and see of short offline learning and, on and long offline learning. So we had here, as you can see, 16 individuals with Parkinson's disease and a match control group, and we had very intensive protocol. So we have, all, all in all, we have four sessions uh, each session, they were trained on the Tower of Hanoi for 18 times, 24 hours away, or 24 to 72 hours, again and again and again. And then we had six months break. We wanted to, to say, 
Eventually, the, the, the plan was to test the patients that are going through pallidotomy, okay? And uh, then they stopped doing pallidotomy in Tel Hashomer. But at least we analyzed the, the, the group with, uh, uh, the, which was supposed to be the control group for the pallidotomy. That's why we have a eventual, uh, initially six month uh, break. But it, it gave us a, a very interesting uh, setting. And we were quite shocked. What we analyzed here is uh, we didn't want to take the absolute uh, time so we, we thought, uh, for solving the task, we thought that the better measure we, would be time per move, because we have another measure of number of moves, and the, <coughs> the time it, it takes to solve the task is confounded, of course, by the number of moves, right? So we, in order to have independent measures, we thought that we better take number of moves and the average time per move. And I must admit, we were very, very surprised by the results. First of all, as you can tell, basically their performance was almost identical to that of controls. So in terms of time, and here again, we'll have a slightly different pictures when we look at errors, which means uh, at, at number of moves. But you can see that they remain a little bit above, and that that's why I, I, I made the comment before that possibly, and that would, would fit into the, the animal models of, uh, I learned from Haggai and my student Hila, which we are, uh, Haggai and myself are supervising, uh, Hila Tzadka, she's doing her PhD with us, and uh, with the meeting with Haggai, I, I, I was exposing to all these uh, models with uh, animals of uh, exploration, etc., and maybe that's exactly what's going on with these with these uh, uh, patients, as if they reach a certain level, they reach a solution, uh, as if uh, in my analogy they found a route from their home to the office. They're happy with it, but the, they would not explore and take the risk of looking into alternative routes. Okay, and they, so they 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 okay, and whatever they're learning, you can see. First of all, even after six months, look, they retain the gain because they are better. Even after six months, they are better than their initial level. When we looked into the number of moves, the picture is slightly more complicated. And probably what we are witnessing here is a trade-off between time and accuracy. And they're trying to do it faster. Uh, but, but, uh, but in terms of accuracy, we can see, in a sense, it's, it's more sensitive to some differences. So let me just point out to two things, and we'll conclude with that. Okay? So first of all, you, you see again the same pattern that overall, overall, they require more moves to solve the Tower of Hanoi than the control group. Again, that supports the previous claim as if they're not reaching the optimal solution uh, like the, the control individuals. The other thing we can, you can see here, an interesting thing, here's the delay. You see that after the first phase of training, both groups have the, the same cost going into, into the, second phase, the second day, okay, the, the session B. So basically they, they, was, they were parallel, there was no interaction here. Okay, so short training or one day training, first training day, both groups paid the same cost. The second day of training, you see already a difference. Here, the cost of the, of, there is an interaction here, and the cost of the, of the control group is significantly less than that of the patient with Parkinson's disease, as if they did not reach really fully the second phase of automaticity. As we said, one condition to see consolidation is when only after a person shifted into the more advanced phase of training. And as we can see here, the fact that they deteriorate or the cost is, is higher indicates that they are not at the same automat automaticity level. And then they start again and they catch up. It's very surprising. But then again, uh, six months after, there is another, again, the, the cost is higher. So which, which all in all lead us to the conclusion, I won't read you all that, if you're interested, you, you're welcome to read it, uh, that, that 
uh, we think that uh, overall we were surprised by their performance and what we see here not it's not a you know they, they, they were initially years ago uh, researchers were uh, aiming or, or concluding that the the basal ganglia to to procedural learning is parallel to the role of the hippocampus to declarative memory and what we so showing here that it's really, we should really be very careful what we're talking about. Are we talking about the errors? Are we talking about the time? Are we talking about the learning rate? Are we talking about the, the, the consolidation? So it really depends on, on what aspect you're looking and that will help us narrow down the specific, uh, the specific uh, or the nature of the specific impairment. I just, this is uh, something I've added uh, uh, we, are ex we are exploring it, and that we were, uh, we were, as I said, I was influenced or exposed to it by Hila and Chagai, and we think that that fits the findings of uh, uh, in the animal literature of really on this continu continuum of uh, 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 of exploration versus uh, I, mean, uh, the, uh, I mean being impulsive on the one hand, or being very, uh, very uh, rigid on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, so they are, they are very, very conservative. They are very careful. And they are rigid, not, uh, not only as expressed by their motor uh, problems, but also they are rigid in terms of their cognitive uh, activities in, in sense that they are not flexible enough and they are not willing to take chances because to move into this transition phase, and, and exploring alternative routes, that's a risky thing because you might end up in a worse uh, solution. But, but to take the risk to improve your performance, I mean, in order to improve your performance, you need to take the risk. And apparently while the control groups are taking the risk and going into this phase, uh, one possibility is that that's exactly what they are not doing. And we are going to explore that by applying the same task and looking into this variability. And our uh, uh, prediction is that what we're going to see with the basal ganglia patient is an extended first phase, and most of them would not go into this transition phase. Thank you. Well, we did not, we looked into our data with the Tower of Hanoi, we don't see it. And it's, it's very difficult to compare one task to another because I don't know uh, how you can compare uh, uh, solving a cognitive task to learning a motor sequence, okay? So it's very difficult to compare. And, and one possibility is that we just need to go through much more intensive training, for example, with the Tower of Hanoi. I'm saying, what I'm saying is <coughs> that an, an ultimate uh, or I would say an optimal solution would be, or improvement, is that once in a while you check uh, and, and look into what the way you're doing things. I mean, it's, it's I think, a good, uh, a good advice in general to our life. I mean, if you do... The I'm saying the evidence we only have from the uh, this motor sequence one. We don't have it yet from other tasks, and we're trying to, to, to find it. I'm saying the logic is that if you want to improve yourself, even if you think that you are solving something, you're doing something in, in a very nice way, uh, it's good to try an, uh, an alternative way, even if you're in, in an in a, uh, unstable situation for a little while. Uh, as, as I said, so far we found it in this task, and we're now looking to the parameters of different other tasks and see if we're going to, to, to see a similar pattern with other tasks. No, it, it's a prediction, as I say. It, it, but it's a prediction against the data. Why? In the data, you haven't found this. Topic. No, we didn't look at it. We didn't apply this task so to... Control. No. In the Hanoi. Because, no, we didn't find it in a certain amount of training we've done. What I'm saying is, I don't know to compare. If I'm comparing, uh, let's say, eight, five blocks 
of, of serial reaction time, first of all, you saw uh, individual variants. But let's say the average is, I, I don't know, it takes uh, five blocks to reach that all of the individuals are already into the second phase. I don't know what would be the equivalent of, uh, of in Tower of Hanoi of 10 blocks of, or five blocks of sequence learning. You see my point? So, I, I, so the fact that I did not find it just suggests that, uh, that at least I'll try, unless I'll, ha I'll reach a different conclusion, that I'll try with more extensive training and see if we'll see. I understand, but I'm saying this is not an explanation of the data that you did find. The differences in the, in the data that you did find is not related to this hypothetical transition because in the paradigm that you use, there is no transition. In the paradigm we use, it's true, but again, we don't know how, how the person... You're right, I see, I see your point. What I'm saying is we did not, uh, we did not train as much, uh, I mean, we did not look into Parkinson patients, how, how they behave. But you're right, in this data, it's, maybe we, it's, exp it's expressed in different ways that we, we, di we don't know yet how, because there are different ways of looking at it. For example, now we, we are looking into, maybe not every move is relevant, because there are certain uh, moves which are determined, okay? And there are certain moves that are determined and maybe some of the moves are irrelevant. So maybe we're not looking at the right thing. So we're still exploring it. So the fact that we did not find it, it one possibility is more training. The other possibility is that maybe we're looking at the wrong things, at the wrong parameters. So, uh, for example, one analysis we did is just how long it takes the first move at each trial. So there are different aspects of the task and we, we are looking at it. So if you'll call me and ask me to talk to you, in a few more years, hopefully, I'll have more uh, answers regarding this issue. Yes? What's the <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> What's the role of dopamine? Uh, because uh, uh, performance deteriorates regardless uh, after a time if it's not reinforced. Re you're talking about Parkinson, about patients, uh, yeah? yeah well, No, that, that's a speculation, as I What's say. The speculation? the speculation is that, as far as I understand, Hila, maybe you want to say a few words about the. the no, you don't want? <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, uh, the little I know from uh, secondhand listening to Haggai Bergman in our discussions is that <coughs> the role, the, the, if you look, let, let's go through it, okay? That there the is. <coughs> excuse me. That. that the, the role of the dopamine, high dopamine or low dopamine, would determine the nature of your behavior. If you have, if you have high dopamine, you'll be more... Mm -hmm. okay. the, the role of dopamine... Just one second. Where? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In in the. I don't recall it, but I can I can uh, send you the the paper. Thank you. As I said, the power the power function explains up to a certain level, and then and then it devi deviates from it. I'll be happy to send you the paper. Um, so the speculation is that, again, if I understand correctly the model, that the the high or low dopamine would determine the nature of, of your behavior in, on, on the continuum of, of, uh, of exploration. The, lower, the higher the dopamine you have, you'll, you'll tend to, to, to explore more, to take more risks, and to be more speculative. The lower the, the dopamine, you'll be more, the bottom line, I mean, the, the, the extreme end of it is rigidity, okay? And we talk about it in terms of motor behavior. I mean, we, we're trying to, to extrapolate it into more the cognitive, the parallel cognitive behavior. And what we're saying is that you, you, you are rigid not only with your motor behavior, but uh, just as well with your cognitive behavior that once you solve, as long as you did not reach a solution, you, you, you keep trying. But once you, you, you get a, a reasonable solution, then, then you stuck with it. And there are, by the way, some questionnaires now 
They're talking about the personality of the Parkinson's disease patient, patients with Parkinson's disease, that apparently they have a, 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 this kind of, of rigid behavior. They tend to repeat the same thing. They tend to, to avoid new experiences, okay? And that is expressed also in their daily behavior. They'll behave, hopefully, like normal person. That even though the, you reach a certain reasonable solution, you'll decide, okay, let me try, uh, let me look at it again, have a fresh look, and see if I'll if I'll get a better a better uh, algorithm to to solve it. Thank you.